My name is Stanley Tucci. I've written and directed a film which just premiered at the Berlin Film Festival. Final Portrait has been a labor of love which I have researched for more than two decades. Okay, let's go. It tells the story of an artist and personal hero of mine, Alberto Giacometti. Not so far. I've been searching for the truth of this enigmatic and obsessive man. And in this documentary, I'm going to try to tell you why. The more I learned about him, the more I, I wanted to see his work and I wanted to know more about him. I remember I went to the Pompidou Museum and we're going through them. They had all kinds of contemporary art and it was sort of chronological and from what I can remember. And then suddenly, in the middle of the museum is this room filled with Giacometti's. And it hit me. And I was so moved by them, overwhelmed by them. And I saw that what he did was what everybody else I had just looked at for the last 45 minutes or so. That's what they were trying to get to. The human condition expressed through art pared it down to its absolute essence. Born in Switzerland in 1901, Giacometti is best known for his stick-thin human figures, which are now the most highly priced sculptures in the world. But it's not just his works that fascinate me. It's also the way he lived. Although rich and famous in his lifetime, he lived in squalor in the same tiny Paris studio, keeping wads of cash under his bed, frequenting prostitutes, and getting into scrapes with the underworld. He lived in this unorthodox way until his death in 1966, and yet maintained his pure artistic vision to the end. I'm going to meet artists, experts, and old friends of Giacometti's to find out how his life and work came together to make him a towering figure of 20th century art. Well, I grew up in Westchester County where my dad was an art teacher in a, what, what you would call a, a state school here. And on the weekends or even after dinner at night, my dad would sketch you, draw you, maybe do a little painting or something. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really great and interesting, unusual experience. There's something fascinating about it. And when you do draw somebody, you know, you know them, you know them so well, and yet you realize you don't know them at all. You think, oh, I had no idea that, that, that her mouth was that, like that, or how that, I mean, you're just, so you're constantly, it's shifting, like the reality is shifting from this person that you know to this person that you've never, ever seen before. What are you doing? Don't move. There. Stay there. That's good. Oh, fuck. Fuck, fuck. How much longer can it go on like this? Fuck! Almost all of Giacometti's work, whether sculpture or painting, was focused on portraiture and the human form. He was famous for restarting works again and again and even destroying them in his relentless pursuit of capturing the truth of the human condition. Tate Modern and the Giacometti Foundation in Paris are preparing for the biggest Giacometti exhibition in Britain for several decades. Some of the pieces show his obsessive reworking in action. The director of Tate Modern and curator of the exhibition, Francis Morris, is going to show me some paintings I've never had the chance to see. We've got two paintings from the collection to show you in here. Beginning with this little gem from 49. In some ways it's so unusual for Giacometti in that it isn't a portrait. Yeah. And yet it's so telling because it reveals the center of his universe, which was the studio. You know, he did this studio again and again and again over yep. the years. And the elements in the studio changed, no. but the studio itself never. He and never... You know, there, there's that stool that all the models sat on. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I never like kind of psychoanalyzing an artist's work, but it's interesting that the first thing that happened to Giacometti was he was sat as a model for his father. Yes, yes. Yeah. So to be looked at and look back at the artist right. must have made an incredible impression on right. him. Right, and he loved it. There's something really comforting about it. But, but I find that really... Um, 
strange. Have you ever sat for an artist? Yeah, oh yeah. Did yeah. you find it comfortable? Uh, it doesn't, no, I didn't find it uncomfortable. My dad was an artist, so yeah. I would sit for him sometimes when I was a kid. I think I... But most people would be very uncomfortable. Yeah. I've been longing to see the second painting, which is of Caroline, Giacometti's muse and lover towards the end of his life. Let's look at the painting of Caroline from 65, yeah. which is what must be one of uh, Giacometti's last work. But it's also com so typical because you get this concentration on a single figure, this time a woman seated, but it really the painting is all about the face and all about the eyes. Yeah. So yeah. that obsession with the gaze is, in a way, the one line of continuity through all his work. The thing about them is that they keep, you know, they move. To, to me, they keep moving. But you're absolutely right. The effect of that is not to create a fixed figure. It's a figure who kind of dips in and out of space. Yeah. You feel everything that's going on inside that person, yeah. emotionally. You probably know more about Caroline than I do. But she was a uh, mistress, lover, close friend. Mm -hmm. It seems there were more late paintings of Caroline than any other model. Yeah, but he became completely obsessed with her yep. t towards the end. He wouldn't let her go. He felt that she gave him so much. Yeah. That's one of, actually one of the lines that we use in the, in the yeah. film is that, you know, I, mean, I think it's interesting that Giacometti often sustained work over a portrait over many, many days. Mm. And it doesn't feel as if he started with one thing and then gradually built up. He returned kind of every morning to start again. Mm. And he explained that every day he saw the model anew so that every stroke is like captures that moment in time and only that moment. It's what an actor has to do so in a way when you're, when you're repeating something yeah. it has to be fresh every time and new every time but the difference between Giacometti and actors is you're mm -hmm. doing it in real time right exactly the, the challenge for Giacometti was of course to capture yeah that movement at what point do you you do, do you, you rest the painting yeah. when do you say it's finished <laughs> but that's why he, he never said they that's, were finished that's yeah. why he never said they were finished you know he was a very modern figure and it was about life and yeah. capturing the essence of life which is a really positive thing I agree Someone who's had first-hand experience of Giacometti's creative process is the businessman and philanthropist, Lord Sainsbury. I was very excited to meet you because uh, I know that you sat for Giacometti. Right. When you were, yeah, when you were about 15 years I was, old? I was 15, yes. My mother said, um, do you think it, uh, David looks rather like a Giacometti, sort of long and lanky, and do you think it'd be nice to get some drawings um, by about better of him. So the next afternoon, my parents went off, and then he just drew me uh, for two hours. To there, was, uh, there was no break or anything, it was just for two hours. Uh, the only interruption is every so often, he rather alarmingly put his head uh, in his hands and, and groan. Uh, I didn't quite know well, how you would, should respond to this, right. so I just sat right. rigidly there. Right. Um, and then, uh, my parents came back after two hours, and there were these five marvellous drawings. Um, my parents said, uh, we'd like to buy three of these. And uh, he said, no, no, he said, I, I can't sell them to you. They're, they're dreadful. I couldn't draw this afternoon. But at this point, Annette, uh, who was the girlfriend, yes, uh, came right. in. And it turned out what she really wanted was a Macintosh from m and so eventually a deal was done. She would get the Macintosh, and my parents would get the three drawings. Um, and we went off clutching, clutching the drawings. Um, <laughs> and these are the drawings? Or these are... These are copies of the drawings. Yeah. I mean, that's a very typical sort of Giacometti yeah. um, sort of pose. The pose, yeah. I love the idea that every sitter sat in the same place, in the same chair, is that right? Year, yeah, 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 for years and years and years, in basically the same pose right. and staring directly at him. The other thing that I do remember very much from sitting with him is, is this extraordinary studio. Yeah. Um, because it was really quite derelict yeah. and dilapidated. Yeah. And I think he, slightly like Francis Bacon, uh, there was this kind of um, very sparse life. Right. And it was about, we don't want any sort of creature comforts. Right. Uh, to get in the way of this kind of 
search for perfectionism right. uh, and this kind of vision. What do you think it was that drew your parents to, to, to Giacometti? People like Giacometti and, and Henry Moore and, and Francis Bacon when they were sort of pariahs of the art world. Well, I think, I think this is the most extraordinary thing about my parents, particularly my father, uh, which is he had no um, art education. Right. Uh, so he would always say, well, I buy what I like. As someone who paints myself, I've always been fascinated by the scratchy, restless quality of Giacometti's painting style. In researching the film, I learned everything I could about his technique. One of the people who helped me do that is Rowan Harris, who painted the portraits of the film live on camera. Rowan? Hi there. Oh, yeah. Rowan's agreed to paint my portrait, see to see it. Giacometti style. Come in. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, very good, thanks. Good, good. It's an incredible treat oh. for me. So, so this is a torture chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's the chair. <laughs> That's the chair, yeah, yeah. Giacometti's works are still protected by his Gosh. copyright. So for this experiment, we were given special permission with one condition. The painting had to be destroyed afterwards. So Rowan, tell us about the experience of painting on the movie. What was that like for you? It's quite stressful doing that sort of thing. You know, I normally work here, you know, off camera and, you know, having time to work things out. So definitely doing it on, on camera is, is, yeah, is a real challenge. It's a very difficult way of painting to mimic and because it has such a sort of freeness and looseness to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm always sort of trying to get the essence of the person, but also because of the work that I do is for the purposes of film, you're also trying to get the quality of that artist. So you've sort of got several things mm. going on in your mind. It's not like being an artist painting his own work. But I remember when you came in with the first versions and I said to you, you're too good a painter. This <laughs> <laughs> is a terrible insult to Giacometti. <laughs> but what I meant was that in a lot of ways his painting is it's almost like you're drawing with, it's with paint, definitely isn't it? like that. I think it's drawing with the brush. There seems to be a real parallel between his sculpture and the way that he uses the clay and manipulates that in the way that he uses a brush as well. I think the two are very interconnected. In how, how do you mean? I feel that it's all linear, the heads. You know, they're a construct of linear marks. Right. But they have a real sort of sculptural um, intensity to mm. them. So mm. a real feel of form and structure. Mm -hmm. And it feels like he's trying to just sort of discover an essence of what he's doing. I think that's what makes them so powerful. So once he feels he's captured that essence, that, the, it, it's, it's over. Yeah. When you think about the palette that he chose and the very conscious ch choice of the lack of color. It is stripping things away to sort of the bare yeah. essentials, isn't yeah. it? With his stuff, you have to be drawn into it, don't you? Yeah, I don't think it's as accessible. I, th I think within the art world, he's still held in you know, very high esteem, but maybe it's why he's not had such a, uh, an appeal to sort of a wider audience. Yeah. So where do you think Giacometti stands as a painter? I mean, I see him as an artist, and I don't really differentiate, I suppose, between his sculptures and his paintings. Well, he's extraordinary. I see him as an artist who worked in drawing, painting, and sculpture, and they were all very closely linked. Yeah. And I think fed off each other, most probably, as well. Right. Oh, Rowan, that will never do. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's so weird trying to make it feel spontaneous, feel loose, yeah. make it look like Giacometti, and also try and get a representation right, of exactly, you. Right, exactly, yeah. It's, yeah, it's difficult. You did it. Ooh, that's really gorgeous. Wow. Thank you, Rowan. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It was really interesting watching Rowan paint and how he was able to approximate Giacometti's style was pretty impressive, very impressive. And it helps you see how singular and particular Giacometti's style is. Giacometti's paintings are obsessive and distinctive. 
But what really made me fall in love with this artist was his sculpture. Alberto Giacometti first came to the attention of the art world as part of the Surrealist movement of 1930s Paris. But it's his later stripped-down, strung-out sculptures cast in bronze that really fascinate me. And one of the best places in the world to see them is Denmark. We're here at the Louisiana Gallery outside of Copenhagen, a place I've always wanted to come. And this has one of the most significant uh, Giacometti um, collections uh, anywhere. The director of the gallery, Paul Eric Tozner, is going to show me how Giacometti's sculpture evolved from surrealism to the iconic figures we know today. You know this one? Yeah. This it's is, so this is the, uh, it's the walking woman. It's from his surrealist period from 1932, yes. Yes. 34. And it's a strange story, I mean, because it used to be another kind of sculpture. It had long arms, you know. Oh, that's right, that's and, right. And the head yeah, yeah, of a cello, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. this typical surrealist yeah, way sure. of dealing yeah. with a... Yeah. Uh, and yeah. then he reduced it. It's gorgeous, and it's interesting that it really is so figurative without all those sort of accoutrements of like the head of a mm -hmm. cello or mm -hmm. something. And that was the reason that he was kicked out yeah. by the surrealist, because he began again to be interested in the outer world. And he couldn't help but get no. back to the figure and they... And basically, he was that. kicked out because he started to use model again. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my. This is the Venice women from 1956. So these are about, you know, a, a universal image of mankind or mm -hmm. womankind. Mm -hmm. They are stunning. Yeah. There's a story about this, you know. N normally, we see this as a very noble presentation of female bodies, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a story that there might be another pretext that Giacometti used to go to the brothels. Mm. And in some of these brothels, the women were like objects positioned along the wall, mm -hmm. and he could select or right, and he would one. choose, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's another kind of a story underneath this very sort of yeah. noble scenery. Yes, yes. I think so typical for the late 50s and onwards. He works so strong with the gaze. Then when you, when you go here, you see them as thing or, yeah, things or bodies or women that are very exposed mm. to your gaze. But you know, if you really look at them, they're looking at you. Yeah. And the thing is, they're dead and alive at the same time. Yeah. Like yeah. no other sculpture I've, I've ever seen. No. There's an incredible energy in them. They mm. almost mm. vibrate. They're not huge sculptures, but there's something that they're, yeah, so, they are, they're incredibly they are very powerful. demanding. They're very yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't describe how I feel about them. All I know is that like, I, I have to keep looking at them. Yeah. I have to keep looking at them because I, if I if I could describe it, I'd probably if I really knew, I'd probably never look at them again. So the big view is from here. There you are. Wow, that's so beautiful. So walking men go to walking man. Okay. <laughs> I guess so. We think about this sculpture being an iconic work by Giacometti, almost like a trademark. Yeah, for his art. yeah, yeah. A key to his importance as an artist in the 20th century is there are links back to ancient times, to mm -hmm. some eternal thing or universal thing. Mm -hmm. And then it's really modern. It is. And it's modern and ancient at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think you just love them because they're so human. They're the essence of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. I think the word essence is good because I always thought of it's just like when you make a really good sauce. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't make it bigger and bigger. You, know? right. you make it smaller right. and smaller right. until you, you have the it. essence of something. Yeah. And you, you see in a lot of his sculptures when he, he adds things and then he takes things away and mm -hmm. away and away and he ends up with this condensed version of humanity or whatever yeah. we yeah. should 
uh, yeah. cornered. I think the more you look at Giacometti, particularly in different settings, the more confirmation I have that there, that there is such significant genius here. Um, and I never, I never tire of looking at them. He really only did what he wanted. I mean, the Surrealists booted him out of their little club because he wasn't following along with their sort of dogmatic ideas of what art is supposed to be. Well, art isn't supposed to be anything. Art is supposed to be just what you want it to be. That's all. And he knew that. And I think there came a purity eventually in his work that I, I, you see very, very rarely, very rarely. Giacometti's sculptures seldom come up for auction, but when they do, they fetch staggering prices. In 2010, Walking Man sold for $104 million. And in 2015, Man Pointing broke world records for a sculpture at $140 million. Anthony Gormley is one of Britain's most famous sculptors, and like me, a huge Giacometti fan. Stanley! Hi. 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 Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. That you Thanks for it. having me. <laughs> so, um, this is a quiet... So this is where it happens? Yeah, this yeah. is where all sorts of things happen. And um, a lot of work's just left for Belgium. We're going to do a show in oh, really? Brussels, oh, uh, which opens in about a month's time. Mm -hmm. I think half of my work has been about trying to make an account of what it feels like to inhabit a body. And the other half of the work is actually making instruments that make people aware right. of their bodies right. in a way, hopefully, that amplifies their sense of being alive. Yeah. But uh, this is one of your attractions to Giacometti, isn't it? I mean, the figure itself, but also the figure I think figure he's interested in, in space. space. I think he, he became obsessed, in a way, with recording his own visual perception of the world mm. around him. And I think, in many ways, the drawings do that yeah. even more extraordinarily than the sculpture. Yeah. That nervous, anxious line that says, I don't know what is a world. I don't even really believe in my own existence. The only way I can realize it is this constant, almost like a like, like a, you know, the graph of an, a, a cardiogram, you know, yeah. nervously notating his perception of the world outside him. Yeah. And all of Giacometti's work is full of accidents that are a byproduct of this anxiety, really. I uh -huh. think anxiety to capture the truth. Yeah. Let's go, let's go yeah, up to the right. drawings, too. After you. Thank you. Giacometti, he's really known for his sculpture, but his painting is extraordinary, and like you say, his drawings are extraordinary. But people maybe, in a way, find it easier to relate to paintings than they do to sculpture, that there's something about sculpture that's sort of off-putting or that they don't really know how to relate to it. Do you, do you find that at all? I am. Um... I'm obviously committed to sculpture. Yes, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and why am I committed to sculpture? It is not a picture of something. Right. It is something. It is something, right. And as a result, the world has to change. Yeah. You're making something that wasn't there before, and you put it out there in the world, and the world has to give it space. And I think there is a real difficulty with sculpture, because in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, it exists in the space that perhaps we want to live in. This space and this, and this time. And this time. Yeah. I think that is one of the most powerful effects of sculpture, if it works, is that you become intensely aware, reflexively, of your own being in time, mm. your position in space. Mm. What makes Giacometti so important to you? There is no greater example of 
what the life of an artist should be. Mm. The continual pursuit of the impossible. The, the obsessive compulsive need to realize experience. And the continual skepticism, the continual re kind of examination of what what, what that job is. Right, right. And he never stopped. And, and I mean, in a way you could say he got, he got caught by his own obsession. Because you could say, you know, those, those that would like to believe in a progressive story of modernity would like to think that we move through periods. Mm. And Giacometti, in some senses, turned his back on that idea mm. and said, no, actually, the cave painters did it better than any of us. There is no progress. We, we, what we have to do is, like they did, bear witness to the existence of other creatures at a distance from right. us. Right. Again and again. Again and again and again. Yeah. And again. Yeah. It was fascinating. He was fascinating. He summed up so clearly why Giacometti is such a great artist, but also being able to articulate sculpture's place in the world as a whole, but also as it relates to us individually and as, and as a society. Um, and its importance and its, and how we deal with it or, or can't deal with it. That's fantastic. By the late 1950s, Alberto Giacometti's artworks were selling for huge figures. But the man himself lived modestly, even squalidly, with his wife Annette and brother Diego in the same decrepit studio he'd moved into in 1927. It's a paradox I've long been fascinated by. And now I'm excited, as I'm about to meet someone who sat for Giacometti. Ica Sapone lives in Nice, but as a girl, she visited the Paris studio many times with her father. How did your father meet uh, Giacometti? Uh, mon père était, um, était tailleur, un tailleur collectionneur. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Il était tailleur de Picasso, de mm -hmm. beaucoup d'artistes. Dans au printemps de 1959, mm -hmm. et bien sûr, papa tout de suite a pris les mesures mm -hmm. de Diego et de et de Alberto et mmh. d'Annette aussi, qui étaient là. Il envoyait les, les costumes par courrier. On est allé chez Giacometti, mmh. parce qu'il disait toujours, euh, je sais, il faut que je, je fasse, que j'échange tout ce que vous avez fait pour moi. Il disait, je voudrais faire, tiens, je voudrais faire le portrait d'Aïka, de ta fille. On allait dans l'atelier qui était pas très grand, hein, qui était, il y avait une mezzanine. Mm -hmm. Et il y avait toutes des peintures sur les, mm -hmm. sur les murs et dessinées. Mm -hmm. Il y avait un, un fauteuil en osier et mm -hmm. un poêle. Alors quand j'arrivais, avant que j'arrive, Annette mettait sur le, sur le fauteuil en osier qui était, il y avait du plâtre, elle mettait du, du papier journal pour pas que je salisse ma robe. Le corps a été fait tout de suite, disons, la robe, tout ça, tout le fond, ça a été fait, a été fait pratiquement très rapidement. Mais la tête, elle recommençait tous les jours. Parce que Alberto me disait, j'arrive pas à faire la ressemblance. Je suis pas capable de faire la ressemblance. Donc je posais tous les jours, tous les jours. C'était, mais c'était agréable. Moi, j'aimais bien quelque part. Yeah, c'était, yeah, parce que yeah. c'était, avec lui, c'était, il était très gentil. Il était, mm -hmm. il était, il avait de l'humour aussi. Parce que finalement, il racontait beaucoup de choses. Après, au bout, là aussi, j'avais posé quand même par plus de 15 jours. Quand euh, il a donné donc mon père, ravi, mon, enfin, tout ça, d'avoir cette, cette œuvre, ben, un très, ben, très beau tableau, et Albert a dit à mon père, je te dois combien Et mon père a dit, mais pourquoi Il dit, mais pour tout ce que tu m'as fait, les costumes, à moi, à Annette, il dit, mais ya, tu me donnes le la toile quand même de... Alors il dit, oui, mais ça c'est le portrait d'Aïka. 
dit « Bon, ça, c'est le travail contre travail, mais le tissu, tu l'as payé ?» Et il a, alors, il dit « Je dois vraiment le signer. » Il dit « C'est une belle toile, mais je ne suis pas arrivée à faire la ressemblance. <rire> » Very exciting to meet Eka. She's one of the only people around who knew Giacometti, who's spent time with him again and again. Uh, and uh, it was it was lovely to have a sort of more personal insight into him. In the 1960s, Giacometti's studio became almost as famous as he was, a symbol of Parisian artistic integrity. To understand why. I've come to meet the writer and art historian, Michael Pepiat. We know Giacometti's studio was this really small, smaller than, the, than, this, than this room, his studio. And he stayed there for 40 years. Can you yes. talk about that? Well, bit? it's strange, isn't it? Possibly he found uh, in the studio, in the Rue Hippolyte, a place that was almost, I think of it, almost like a, um, like a shell mm -hmm. um, that It, it was his sort of carapace yeah. that protected him. Not so much it protected him from the world, but I think he found he had everything he needed there. Yeah. And this is rather, I mean, it is a rather marvelous thing that he could have had any kind of palatial space mm -hmm. with sort of, you know, rooms to draw, rooms to paint, rooms to make sculpture. But he had everything, this complete sort of essence in that single room, and it was a complete Giacometti universe. Yeah. It was its own work of art. In it the was end, its own it? work yeah. of art, exactly. But everything so, was, yeah. like you say, reductive, yeah. distilled, yeah. distilled yes. almost yes. To, to its purest sense. Absolutely. And then the studio yes. itself becomes that. I think it probably helped him get to the essence. I mean, there wasn't a, a shred, not a suggestion of luxury. Yeah. All that came from this search for the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's why we're very moved by it. Giacometti's art, not just that it's reduced to the bone so that you've got this essence. You can't, you know, you can't reduce it anymore. You've, that's it. Uh, but it's because it's the essence of the truth yeah. that he's looking always to reproduce life, which, of course, is an impossible thing. Right. What was happening in the art scene in the 50s, 50s and 60s, up until Giacometti's death? Things were changing pretty... Distinctly yes, they? by that time, I think um, Giacometti had partly become famous, not, not just for the work and his way of life, uh, but for this studio. And the studio, although he led a, um, a, a, a kind of monk-like existence there, uh, the whole world came to him. Um, Didn't as, Marlena Dietrich come to him? Yes, she Wasn't did. Yeah. She did. Uh, Picasso visited him. Obviously, all those photographers visited mm -hmm. him. A lot of artists visited mm -hmm. him. Uh, huge numbers of poets and writers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they liked sort of seeing him in his lair. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, although it was terribly broken down, it was a sort of magical space that drew people. He only did what he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it. Yes. And that's what makes him so, so pure. Yes. You could say if you manage to capture the essence of, you know, of mankind, it's going to be uh, universal and it's going to be, um, it's going to be beyond uh, any, any particular period. It's going to be for all it's time. It's timeless. Eternal. Yeah. 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 Yes. He's so interesting because of the way he worked, the intensity with which he worked, and the intensity with which he lived his life, which was bizarre. And those two things, it's like his life and his art became the same kind of thing. Michael confirmed what I felt when making the film, that the studio was the center of Giacometti's world. We had to build a detailed replica of it for the film, but at the time, we couldn't look inside, as it's now a private residence and closed to visitors. In recreating the studio, we wanted to be as specific as possible. Well, of course, we weren't allowed to get in there, but we did have uh, so much to draw from, because um, it was very well documented. Um, 
But this here is, the, these externals, for the most part, the roof line certainly remains the same as it did during Giacometti's time. It felt very humbling to be recreating his world, his life, uh, in this uh, set uh, that we built, which of course was as near as damage, a reincarnation of the exact space that he frequented every day of his life for numerous years. The model is to scale, so as you can see it at the studio, the bedroom, and then the outside courtyard here with a mezzanine area up here. These walls lived and breathed the artist. You know, he used the walls as his canvas. And then here, really sort of back to basics, he had his toilet, his pissoir. The truth was that he used to put a plank of wood over the pissoir, stand on it and pull the chain, but this time not the toilet chain, the chain that turned the shower on and he'd shower over the pissoir. That's how gruesomely base his life was. Insane, really. It's not like, you know, a starving artist who was only successful, only made money after death. Money's like toilet paper to him. Since we've been filming, the owner of the studio has come home. He's agreed to let me see inside that almost sacred space for the very first time. Permesso. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hello, fine, and you? Good, good, yeah. good, good, good. Welcome to the... To the Giacometti uh, studio. I can't believe it. I've been living here for uh, 20 years now. The transformation of the studio has been made uh, uh, after the, uh, the, the, the Giacometti uh, death. Yes, yes, right. Are the walls the same? Is this the, this is the space, right? Was this, this yes, was a little bit yes. bigger or no? The dimension have not changed. But um, he used the courtyard to make his uh, sculpture. The bigger, yeah, 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 yeah. And this was the door. This is the original. Yeah, it was the... Uh, the way uh, of the way entering in, in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the studio. Well, this movie we made, recreating the studio, it was a huge effort and very exciting to do. And I never, ever thought that I would walk into the actual space. Thank you. So you're Thanks welcome. a lot. OK. I never expected to, to be in this space, ever. By the late 1950s, Alberto Giacometti was one of the most celebrated artists in the world. But what fascinates me is his secretive inner life. And the person who I think holds the key is Caroline, the mysterious other woman in Giacometti's life. You know, his relationships with women were very, <laughs> very complicated. He got married sort of begrudgingly uh, in the late 40s to Annette who lived with him in this sort of shithole of a, of a place in Paris. Eventually he bought her an apartment that she lived in, but he never wanted to go there. He wanted to live in this hovel. He frequented prostitutes all the time. That never changed after he got married. She put up with it for whatever reason. And he ended up towards the end of his life having a long-term relationship with this woman, Caroline. At that point in his life, she was ever-present. Caroline died in 2015. Unfortunately, I never got to meet her. But I've come to meet a man who did. Former art critic Franck Maubert was as fascinated by her relationship with Giacometti as I am. So fascinated that he wrote a book about it. Et là, j'arrive. Chez elle, je sonne. C'était une vieille dame, déjà fatiguée. Et, mais je reconnaissais le regard du portrait que j'avais vu au Musée d'Art Moderne des années plus tôt. J'ai commencé à l'interroger sur, euh, sur Giacometti. C'est ce qui m'intéressait, c'était leur rapport et comment ça s'était passé. Alors, elle, leur rencontre. Alors, elle m'a dit qu'elle avait euh, à peine 20 ans. Quand, euh, quand ils se sont rencontrés dans un bar à côté d'ici, rue Bréa, qui s'appelle Chez Adrien. 
Et c'est un bar où il y avait des, on va dire, des filles de bar. C'était des filles un peu légères, plutôt jolies, euh, qui étaient jeunes et qui montaient avec les clients parfois. Il y avait deux filles qui étaient là, qui connaissaient et qui lui disent « Ah ben, il y a une nouvelle qui est arrivée, une petite nouvelle, elle s'appelle Caroline. » Et donc, il lui présente. Et là, d'un seul coup, ça a été un coup de foudre entre... Alberto et Caroline, tout de suite, au point qu'ils ont passé la nuit ensemble à marcher, à arpenter les, les trottoirs de, de Montparnasse, à les boire un verre dans un bar, etc., jusqu'au petit matin. Et c'était comme une vraie histoire d'amour qui débutait. Je pense qu'il a été un peu instrumentalisé, on pourrait dire aujourd'hui, par, euh, par ces hommes du, du milieu euh, de la nuit et des, un peu du milieu un peu gangster, on va dire. Et donc, euh, parce qu'on savait que Giacometti avait de, avait de l'argent et, et qu'il gardait son argent, il n'avait pas de compte en banque et euh, il mettait tout sous son, sous son lit, sous son matelas. Et, euh, et donc, le, 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 les, les gangsters, un jour, sont venus intervenir avec, avec euh, Caroline il y a deux types qui ont garé une grosse buick devant, la, devant la, la, son atelier et ils, sont, ils ont débarqué dans son atelier puis ils ont demandé où est l'argent. Il a dit mais prenez tout parce qu'ils s'en fichaient complètement de l'argent. Ouais. Quand Alberto a, a rencontré Caroline, la vie a changé et pour Caroline et pour Alberto. Ouais. Ça a été une bouffée de, une bouffée de jeunesse, quoi, une ouais. sorte de rajeunissement parce que Alberto avait 60 ans et elle avait 20 ans. Although Giacometti remained married to Annette, Caroline was his muse and lover, and he painted her right up until his death in 1966. The painting I saw at Tate Modern is just one of at least 28 portraits of Caroline. Giacometti was obsessed with her, and these paintings declare it to the world. Giacometti's life was a paradox. He'd become one of the most famous artists in the world, yet unlike his contemporaries, he continued to live in squalor and chaos until the very end. I'm going to talk to one of the last people alive who knew Giacometti and might be able to tell me why. I'm at the Meist Gallery near Nice to meet Adrian Meist. His father, Amy, was gallerist to several of the leading artists of the century, including Matisse and Miro, and was one of the first people to see the importance of Giacometti's work. Your father really made a significant difference in Giacometti's career. <coughs> when when did that <coughs> relationship begin? Um, my father opened the gallery in Paris in 1945. My father used to say the best way to, to to help an artist to, be, to become known is to make prints. Because mm -hmm. print is not expensive mm -hmm. and it's original. Right. And um, my father asked to Alberto to make a series of uh, lithographs. Mm. Uh, the morning I go to Alberto, he gave me a few uh, drawings on the lithographic paper. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I go to the printer, we made the the proof, I go back to, to show to Alberto. He made, cor he corrected. I did this for one month. On that, that month where you were running back and forth, were, were, you, see, were you also watching him work? Alberto, uh, he liked to make portrait. Mm. Uh, and he speak when he made portrait, mm. he continued to speak. He made some drawing of me, but uh, he found I, 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 too, I moved too much. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you have to stay. He liked you to stay still, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. I have to move. <laughs> I have a beautiful itching there, if you want to see. Mm -hmm. I will show you. I have the only uh, copy of the itching of the Objet Invisible. Oh, wow. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's they, beautiful. And he don't like, so he destroys the, the copper. <laughs> he played. The studio was a very poor place. Yeah. He don't want to, to tell. 
I ask a few times to Alberto, why well, Alberto, you don't buy a nice apartment. And he said, I don't want to be the, the prisoner of the comfort. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's one of the most important artists. Yeah. He made the, he's uh, just uh, middle, before the, the 19th century and the 21th century. He was uh, at the center. Yeah. I know all the, these great artists, yeah. Miro, Matisse, Braque, and Giacometti was, I feel that he was uh, the most important. Mm. Yeah. Being on this journey, it hasn't changed my opinion of Giacomo. It's only enhanced it, it's enriched it. And it's confirmed my belief that he really was the consummate artist, the sort of perfect artist in a way. And these sculptures, those paintings, the drawings, each one is a search for the truth. And you see it and it's undeniable. And, that, and I don't, I have to say, I don't know any other artist in which we see that so clearly. He is a timeless, timeless artist. I'm sad to, to leave it. But you can always go look at them someplace.